children are dismissed to children's church at this time. So today we are continuing our series on spiritual warfare, and so far uh, we've talked about what spiritual warfare is, Uh, we've talked about who our foe is in Satan, we've talked about what his powers are, him and his demons, Uh, we've also talked about who our ally is in this battle with Jesus Christ, and we're going to recap that here in just a few minutes, Uh, that was last week. This week we're going to be shifting a little bit more to actively being in a spiritual battle. And this, this is what we're going to call preparing for the battle. But to do that, we're going to play a little game. Well, not us, just one person in particular. Robin Kammerer, come on down. Yes. Yes. Everybody give Robin a hand. Give Robin a hand. You know what? You could have, you have Philip come down here and help you. Help, help, help you? Help. help you? No. We, we, won't do that to, we won't do that to you. All right. So here we have some items on the table, okay? Uh, this, this is a game in preparing for battle. You have to know what weapons are going to work for whatever foe you're facing, okay? And so in order to do that, we're going to flash some, some foes on the screen, and you get just a couple seconds to figure out which of these weapons... That's ice, by the way. Which of these weapons is going to work for the appropriate foe. Then when it's all said and done, we'll figure out which ones you got right, which ones you got wrong. But you can only use each item once. This is kind of like a mixture between but The Price is Right and some other show about killing things. Okay, so <laughs> let's get our first image on the screen. That would be the Wicked Witch. Which item would you use to kill the Wicked Witch with? Ice. Okay, so pull the ice over there. Okay, lay it right there. That's number one. Okay. Next image, Wolfman. Which item would you use to kill the wolf? Before we go any further, let 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 me share with you, in case you can't see. We had ice, which she chose as number one. We have a hammer. Okay? It's a 16 penny hammer. It's pretty heavy. We have a bottle of Dasani water. Only the good stuff. We have fire. Okay? We have a silver bullet made by myself, okay? And we have a wooden stake, not the kind you eat. Okay, I Wolfman. Like switch my first answer. Uh, well, now, wait a minute. Should, should we allow her to switch her first answer? Should, should we show leniency and grace? We'll show forgiveness this one time. Pick your first weapon. Okay, the water. Okay, she's going with the Dasani water. Okay. Wolfman, how would you kill Wolfman? Hey, 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 no help from the audience. <laughs> um, the stick. Okay, lay that down there as number, number two. No, People I'm are sorry. disappointed in your choices. <laughs> I can already tell. People are like, I knew that one. All right, next one. A zombie. How would you kill a zombie? Let me just say, do you know how hard it was to find a picture of a zombie to put up there that wasn't like nasty zombie? Okay. How would you kill a zombie? No help, no help, no help. He's really close. He's really, He's really close. close. Yeah. Um, I, I, um, I would hit him with the hammer. Okay, that's your choice. So she's chosen the 16 pity hammer. Yes. All right. Next, next picture, Dracula. Oh. How would you kill Dracula? Should we allow her to trade one one item out? You may trade one of your chosen items out. You may phone a friend. Yes, phone a friend. Who needs? Thank you. Yes. Okay, so this that's your choice for Dracula. All right. Dracula. All right. I forgot my oh my. That's all right. Well, that's all right. We'll we'll go back. All right. Next picture, a mummy. How would you fight off a mummy? What did you say? How would you fight off a mummy? Mummy, what, what would you do? I don't know. Um, I catch him on fire. Does he look flammable? Well, yeah, I kind of Okay, did. then use your fire. All right. Next image. 
The blob. How would you fight the blob? Ice. Ice. Good choice. All right. Let's go back to image number one. Let's see how she did. She chose water for the Wicked Witch. Was she right? She was correct. Good job. Yes. Okay. Her next image was the wolf man. She chose originally the steak, which she changed later. What should it have been? The silver bullet. You missed one. It's all right. All right. Your next image was the zombie. She chose the hammer. Was she right? She was right. Yes. Next image, Dracula. She chose a wooden steak. What else would have sufficed? Garlic. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Wasn't up here. Maybe I could have blessed this water real quick, right? <laughs> Holy water. Okay. Next picture, the mummy. She chose fire. Was she right? She was right. And the last one was the blob. She chose ice. She is correct. Good job. You only missed one. That's all right. All right. Very good. Very good. So, preparing for battle is important, and without a little bit of grace. Robin would have been in trouble <laughs> with some of those. Uh, I think the wolfman would have laughed at her stake, and, and I don't think she would have been in very good shape. But we're going to talk this morning about how to prepare for a spiritual conflict with Satan and his demons. So turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ephesians. We're going to be in chapter 6 for the next couple of weeks as we study uh, this particular set of scriptures. And it's Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 and following. Uh, as I mentioned before, as, as we started this series a number of weeks ago, and um, I, I want to make sure I, I make this clear too, a lot of my sermon notes, a lot of my sermon outline are going to come from a variety of different sources, uh, David Platt, uh, Neil Anderson, Chip Ingram. A lot of what we're going to talk about today comes from, from Chip and from David Platt. So these, I, I say that these aren't just Jason's thoughts, right? This isn't just Jason making stuff up that I find in Scripture and say, okay, we can make this work. These are from very theologically minded men who've spent a great deal of time studying uh, over these subjects. So what have we learned so far on, on, on spiritual warfare? What, well, Satan and his demons were at one point angels, okay? Uh, they fell when they sinned for various reasons, right? We, we discussed that a couple weeks ago, pride, among other things. Uh, we know that Jesus is the Son of God. He was the creator of all things, including Satan himself, we talked about last week. Jesus came to earth as a human and bore the weight of mankind's sin on the cross. He was 100% man and 100% God. When he did this, Satan was defeated. Sin's power was broken, but yet these fallen angels and Satan still engage in this guerrilla-type warfare to deceive, discourage, divide, and destroy God's people and God's plan. So, God tells us that he wants to equip us. He wants to prepare us to walk in the strength of the Lord, in the strength of his power, so that we can withstand the enemy's schemes and his multifaceted attacks. And so that we can defeat him in specific battles in our lives, in our work, in our family, and yes, even at church. So how do we do that? Well, we read out of the book of Ephesians. So stand with me if you would. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 and following. It says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this morning. God, we thank you for the power of your word and what it means for us in our walk with you. Lord, we thank you for our time of worship. And God, I pray now as we study your holy word that you would give us discernment and wisdom. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So we discussed um, last week that the devil and his demons, uh, they're a pretty strong force. Uh, we need a strong ally when it comes to battling them. And the only ally that's strong enough to do that is Jesus Christ himself. So let's do a little recap. This was from last week for those of you who may not have been there. 
Uh, first of all, we talked about who is Jesus. He is the Son of God. Uh, unlike humans, however, Jesus' existence did not begin with his physical birth on this planet. Jesus is not a created being. Jesus was not created by God. Jesus is God. Jesus did not begin to be when things were created, but he already was. He was the Word. So what powers does Jesus, our ally, have? And We decided that answer is very simple. Jesus can do anything that's in accordance with the will of his Father. He has control over creation, over the angels, over the demons. He even has ultimate control over Satan himself. We talked about how Satan doesn't really want you to know that. It doesn't work to his advantage. By following the will of the Father and dying a sinner's death on the cross, Jesus ultimately defeated Satan in the spiritual realm and therefore broke the power of sin. And now, uh, now that we know our foe, uh, we, we know his power, uh, we know our ally, we know his power, now we have to learn how to prepare for this battle, this, this cosmic conflict, as some of your versions uh, will, will call it. Well, how does Paul tell us that we are to prepare? Well, first of all, he says this, Therefore, take up the full armor of God, that you may, may be able to resist the evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Okay, basic command here, put on the full armor. That's what he tells us to do. Put on the full armor. We're to be ready, be fully prepared, to withstand this grave and difficult dark time when it comes upon us. And we talked uh, a few weeks back, this is not a suggestion of maybe Satan will attack you. Maybe you will get drawn into a spiritual warfare. The reference here is that, guess what? I could throw Buttercup in there, right? Guess what, Buttercup? You're a Christian. Satan and his demons don't like that. And you're going to come under spiritual attack. It, it's going to happen. We are to put on our spiritual armor to be prepared for this attack. Now, if you look in your Bibles, and, and some of you will read ahead, and, and, I, and I do that sometimes too when, when, when I'm uh, in, sitting in the congregation listening to, to different pastors, uh, there are six pieces of armor in total that we're going to talk about. The first three that we're going to look at today are all specifically defensive. They're all specifically defensive, and we'll discuss uh, that as we go through, and then we'll discuss uh, the last three next, next week when we, when we come back. So verse 14 says this, Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. How many people's Bible says, girded your loins with truth? Couple? Couple? ESV is, is, is probably going to say, put on a belt. Uh, I'm pretty sure NIV is going to say something about uh, put on your belt, uh, fasten your belt, various things like that. What does gird your loins actually mean? Why does Paul say it quite like this? Well, you're going to notice as we go through Ephesians chapter 6 in this section on spiritual warfare, the metaphors that Paul uses are in reference to Roman soldiers. Okay, we see the pictures, we think back, and we're like, oh, I kind of know what he's talking about. Well, the people of Jesus' day didn't have to think very far because they were under Roman occupation at the time. They saw Roman soldiers quite often. They knew what their gear was. They knew what their uniforms consisted of. They knew very well the idea of the Roman soldiers. So Paul uses something that's very, very clear for them to get a handle on. A Roman soldier, as part of his uniform, would have wore a belt. Arguably one of the most important pieces of his armor. Why is that? All of the rest of his armor either hooked or relied upon the fact that he had on a belt. We'll talk about that as we move. And when you study Roman, Roman soldiers, um, you, you, you realize, depending on where, where you're looking, um, 
it was easy to know whether or not a Roman soldier was on duty because if he was off duty, his belt was unfastened, right? There was no need for him to have the tight belt on. He was off duty. He was off the clock. And, and, and you know, how, how true is that of, uh, of police officers and, and, and first responders? They come in, and the first thing they do is they take off that heavy utility belt with all of the stuff on it because they're, they're no longer officially on the clock. And same thing holds true with, with the Roman soldier. So, so if they were off duty, their belt was unfastened. But if they were on duty their belt would be fastened and their equipment would be attached to it. So the very first thing that a Roman soldier would do when he was getting ready for his shift, when he was getting ready for battle, is he would put on his belt. So where does the phrase, gird your loins, come in? We see this in a couple of other places in Scripture, but oftentimes a Roman soldier would have some sort of a cloak or some sort of a robe that would be a part of their uniform. And it would be really difficult if he was going into battle to have this heavy cloak limiting his movements and getting in the way. So what they would do is they would, they would roll their cloak up and they would shove it in their belt to keep it back and out of the way. Therefore, they were girding their loins. They were preparing for battle. Does that make sense? So after he girds his loins, he's, he's ready for whatever is going to come his way. You know, I, I talk about the belt being an important piece of the uniform. What else would go on that belt? The sword. We don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but I wanted to make that point clear. While the Roman soldier's belt was one of utility, the Christian's belt is one of truth. What does that mean? The word truth uh, in, in, in many circles means candor, sincerity, uh, truthfulness. Uh, it's rooted with this objective reality of the truth of God's word, right? And that's, that's something we're looking at. But, but here specifically, it refers to the subjective, practical application of openness and honesty in all things that have to do with God and man. Now, that was a mouthful, and I'm going to try to explain what, what we mean by that. Paul has already told us the truth about who we are in Christ. Remember the first five chapters of Ephesians? He, he takes us through that whole process, and he lays out who we are in Christ. Uh, you've been accepted into the beloved. You've been redeemed. You've been bought with a price. You're part of God's family. You've been sealed with the Spirit. He tells us that because of that, we now have a job to do. We are to put on the belt of truth. And this is the practical application for the Christian to see the truth of God, to see the truth of yourself, seeing the truth of others through the worldview and, and the clarity of, of what is biblically, scripturally true in accordance with God's Word. Why? is this first step so important? Why is the belt of truth so important? Who remembers two weeks ago, why is the belt of truth so important? Anybody know? I'll give you a hint. Satan's number one tactic. Why is the belt of truth so important? Because his weapon is deception. Satan's number one weapon is deception. Why would our first piece of armor not be the belt of truth to stand against Satan? Satan's first attack was the deception of Eve. The enemy is constantly whispering using this go-to weapon of his whispering in our ears. He'll question God's goodness. He'll question the accuracy of the truth. Are you sure? Are you sure that's what this means? He'll talk about truth and he'll twist it just a little bit. Just enough to get us to question. He'll make sin look appealing. Because of all of these things, we are told to put on the belt of truth. How does that work? Well, it begins with us getting honest, right? 
To be honest with God is to be honest with ourselves. We, we are by no means perfect creatures, but we are forgiven creatures. Even so, we must be willing to own when we messed up. We must be willing to own our own junk in our lives without blaming, without trying to push it off on some other reason or someone else, or without saying, God, and until I get honest with you, there's, there's, there's no hope to live and defend and stand firm against the lies because Satan's goal is deception. If we're not honest with ourselves about who we are, then when it comes time to stand and put on this belt of truth, you're going to find that it may not fit quite the way it's supposed to. There may be some gaps in that particular piece of armor. What do I mean by that? Psalm 139, and this is the story um, of when David was, was, was confronted with, with, with his sin, and, and we, all know, um, we all know how this particular story played out, Bathsheba. He sinned, he lied about it, he tried to cover it up. When he was confronted with his sin, he denied it, he shifted blame. And when he finally was shown the truth, when, when, when Nathan finally reveals this truth to him, it is, it is you, you are that man. And he realizes what he's done, his heart was broken. He came to a place where he was honest with himself. He was honest with God. There are probably some in this room who you may not be quite at that point right now. And I want to encourage you that that when you attempt to stand and fend off Using the belt of truth, you may find that, that your armor is not quite doing what it's supposed to. So listen very carefully to, to what I say next. Um, and, and, and this, I say this as, as, as bluntly as I can. If you believe that you are above the ability to fail, if you think that because you believe your walk with the Lord is strong enough that Satan can't really touch you, you're not being honest with yourself. You're not being honest with God. Satan has, in essence, led you into this false sense of security. He will at some point attack you. The belt of truth, while it may sound weak, and I remember in, 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 in younger days and studying this, thinking, wow, the belt of truth, woohoo! I'm going to go into battle with the belt of truth. It, it may sound like it doesn't possess much power, But in reality, um, it's quite possibly one of the most powerful weapons we have against Satan and his number one tactic of deception. We're told after the belt of truth that we are then, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So the second thing we are to do, we are to put on the breastplate of righteousness. Well, what exactly is the breastplate of righteousness? This was probably, um, from the Roman soldier's perspective, uh, it, was, it was probably a, a breastplate made of bronze. Uh, if they were more, um, a more affluent soldier, it may have been made of some sort of a chain mail or something along those lines. Uh, the idea of the breastplate was that it, it, it started just below the chin, just right at the neck, and it would go all the way down uh, and, and, and cover almost down to the thighs on the side. And, and the idea was that it was to protect your vital organs, but most importantly, was to protect your heart, and oftentimes these breastplates were called the, the, the heart protectors, and, and, and rightfully so. And so when Paul's talking about wearing the breastplate of righteousness, when he, when he says righteousness, he's, he's basically saying the uprightness, the right living, integrity in one's lifestyle and in their character. And so we, we, we conclude that righteousness is conforming our will with God's will. This breastplate of righteousness that guards and protects our heart, it, this is the practical application of the truth to our lives. And I'll explain how, how this works. The, the, the belt of truth means being honest with God and knowing who we are in Christ. The breastplate of righteousness is simply applying that truth 
when you're coming under attack, right? And, and it's the application of the truth that God gives you through his word, through his community, through our worship. It, it, is, it is as simple as saying wearing the breastplate of righteousness is seeing the truth and applying it. Knowing what's right, knowing what's not right, and making the right decision in the midst of that. That's wearing the breastplate of, of righteousness. When you apply it, this whole spiritual warfare thing kind of takes a little bit of a turn, right? Unfortunately, if it were just that simple, that a Christian would say, I know the truth, I have on the belt of truth, and I'm going to apply it right now. All is well. Satan has defeated. I can live my life. It's, it's a glorious day. It's not quite that simple. Why? Because we're human. Even though oftentimes we, we may know the truth, we fail to apply the truth when the truth needs to be applied. That's why so many Christians struggle with their walks. If you remember back in, in week number two, we talked about how our foe was, was formidable and talking about Satan. Unfortunately for us, he doesn't just rely on one tactic, right? He, he has a, an arsenal. He, he loves his deception, but he has an arsenal that, that he uses. And one of the things, and one of the ways that, 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 that he gets to us, one of the ways that, 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 that he drives us to these places and these spiritual uh, conflicts is that he is the deceiver, right? But he's also the accuser. He deceives first, then he accuses. His second major way to attack us is the condemnation that comes with being accused. Let me tell you a little bit about condemnation. Satan whispers. We know the truth. Maybe in this case we failed to apply that truth. We fell, we sinned, and Satan quickly turns from cheerleader to mob leader, complete with torches and pitchforks, and he's marching down the street calling your name. This, ladies and gentlemen, is where the guilt comes in. Guilt is a killer. You call yourself a Christian after what you did? After where you've been? After the things that you've looked at? After the things that you bought? You consider yourself a Christian. Mm. After all the stuff that you're addicted to? Satan not only wants to get into our hearts, but he wants to stay there. That's his goal. As Christians, we cannot let him take up a permanent residency. I'm not talking about possession. We, we've already dealt with that in the first couple of weeks. But the breast, breastplate of, of righteousness works like this. God reveals his truth. You're honest with him. Then you put the breastplate into practice, and when the condemnation comes, you stand your ground. That's how it works. You say, Satan, that's a lie. I'm complete in Christ. Or you say, that may have been true, Satan. I may have messed up. I may have, I may have been a phony. But I believe in 1 John 1, 9, where it says, If I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I stand upon the shed blood of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am complete in him. I am pure in him. Get away from me, Satan. I'm not going to hear that trash. I'm not going to listen to those thoughts. You beat me once, you will not beat me again. God wants us to walk by faith. God wants us to put on this breastplate of righteousness. God wants to block that condemnation on your heart. 
You don't have to live there. You don't have to live there. And you can say, but Jason, you don't know what, what I've done. I've crossed the line with my actions. Satan has every right to condemn me because I chose wrong. I'm guilty. My reply to you would be this. I hear you. I hear you. Josh probably said it better than, than, than anything this morning, right before we started worship, and he said, we're not here because we're perfect. He and I, we fail. I'm not here because I'm perfect. If you ever get the impression that, that I'm the pastor sitting at the pulpit because I got everything together, please, please don't. You're sitting out there, hopefully not because you think you're perfect, but because you realize this is the place you need to be because you're not perfect. The bottom line is this, when it comes to, to our guilt, when it comes to when we've messed up, when we've made the wrong choice and Satan is, is condemning us, when we willfully turn away from what we know God's will is for us, we willfully open ourselves up to demonic attack. We see God's will, we know God's will, and we choose to not follow that will. We open ourselves up. The tempter becomes the accuser, and the onslaught of guilt and shame begins. And this is what we have to understand. This is where we have to come to when we are in that position, when we are in that place of bondage. Satan is the tempter, Satan is the accuser, but Satan is not the convictor. Matt, is that a word, convictor? It'll work, right? The Holy Spirit is the one whom convicts. Why does the Holy Spirit convict? To bring us to God. To bring us to a place of repentance and reconciliation. That is the Holy Spirit's job. Once you've sought forgiveness, once you've repented of your sins, once you have turned back to God, any shame, any guilt, any condemnation that you feel is not from Him. It's from Him. How do you deal with it? You put on the breastplate of righteousness. You say, God, I know the truth. I'm going to apply it. You reflect this supernatural love and holiness of Christ. Big, bold letters. This is easier said than done. I know. Nobody ever said that spiritual warfare was going to be easy. Finally, this morning, our third piece of armor, after we put on the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness, verse 15, it says, And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We are to shod our feet with the preparation of this gospel of peace. Well, what does it mean to shod our feet? Well, oftentimes Roman soldiers would drive nails through their shoes in order to give them better traction on the battlefield. The point would go down, not up, right? Just, just in case you were thinking, that's painful. No. They would drive the nails through the bottoms of their sandals so that they would get traction. In essence, they created cleats, right? It's argued that it was Alexander the Great that came up with this idea. I don't, I don't know. But the idea was that they have a firm foundation when they were in battle. That they could rely on the fact that when the enemy pushed against them, they could dig their feet down and have something to grab onto. The Bible talks in depth about how important it is to have a firm foundation in our walks with Christ. Matters of spiritual warfare are no different. We must have a foundation that supports this belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. To do this, we shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel. 
The word preparation um, in this sense means uh, establishment. It, it means to, to have a, a firm foundation. It conveys this idea of the readiness to share the gospel, the gospel that brings peace between man and God. That's a pretty powerful piece of defense, if you think about it. Satan uses deception to trick us into sinning, and then he uses condemnation to neutralize us after we've committed the sin, but he doesn't stop there. He continues on with his full court press. Satan also specializes in casting doubt, and oftentimes it's on the very basis of God's goodness itself. And more importantly, by the way in which we receive, which is through the gospel. I said this Wednesday night in our Wednesday night Bible study, and I can't, I can't say this enough, Satan loves to attack grace. Not grace, Warner. Grace that is given to us by God. He wants to attack it. Why attack grace? We'll talk about that. If he can get you doubting, if he can especially get you to doubt God's grace, then he has gained a major foothold in your life. He says little things like, you don't really think that God could forgive you for this, do you? You don't, you don't think that that could happen. Or he'll say, God's grace is perfect, but you messed up. Maybe a little more than what God can forgive you for. We can say these things and we can talk about these things and, and we can go, oh, well, I, I understand grace and I know that that's not how God works. But when you're in the trenches, when the fiery darts are flying over your head and Satan whispers these things to you, Guess what? You better have the preparation of the gospel of peace on your feet. You better have a good firm foundation. When Satan begins to cast doubt, we must remember this. The word gospel means good news. What is the good news? That Jesus died on a cross to pay for our sin. The sins for all mankind and the power of sin was broken and Satan has been defeated. You are free. Free from what? You're free from Satan's attack on grace. We are saved by grace through faith. We confess our sins. We are forgiven. We cannot be snatched from God's hands at that point. Behind all the truth, behind the breastplate of righteousness is the gospel, this good news that has transported you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And with that comes all the rights, privileges, and position that being a child of God entails, which means that through the blood of Christ in your life, you have victory over Satan, over his lies his deception, over his casting of doubt, over the guilt, over the shame, over the condemnation. In closing this morning, I'm going to ask that Josh would, would come up and, and get ready for invitation. God has effectively defeated Satan in, in his agenda. With Jesus Christ dying on the cross, he's delivered us from our sins and, 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 and that ultimate penalty. And at some point when we pass from this life into the next, we will have ultimately defeated sin's very presence. But until then, we are engaged in guerrilla warfare with the enemy. It's just that simple. 
this battle, uh, it involves a responsibility on our part. And, and so many of us would like to think, well, if I just come to church and if I just live right, I won't have to encounter these things of the demonic world. And, and that's just that's what Satan wants you to think, right? We have to be honest with ourselves. We have to be honest with God. We have to respond with the truth that we know to be the truth. We have to have a clear understanding of what the gospel, what the good news is, and how it applies to our life, and how it applies to this, this idea of spiritual warfare. And I will say this, and, and many, many scholars will, will agree with this, um, the majority of spiritual warfare that, that, that we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis um, may never actually take us beyond these first three layers of, 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 of armor. But there may be times. I'm not saying that, that you may or may not have spiritual warfare. You will. But there are times in your life where you may encounter a major battle that requires you to not only be defensive in how Satan comes at you, but it requires you to actively engage the enemy. And to do that, there's a couple more pieces of armor that we need to familiarize ourselves with. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about next week. I would ask that you would stand with me this morning as we have our time of invitation. If God has spoken to you this morning and, and, and you need to come to the altar and, and spend some time with him, it's open. Uh, if you would like someone to pray with you, we would love to do that. I'll be down here. A couple of our deacons will be down here as well. But I just want to encourage you to respond to the Holy Spirit's lead this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for today. Lord, we thank you for the clarity of your word, for the truth of your word. God, I pray that you will move uh, throughout this room this morning. As we have our time of invitation, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.